And it is my great pleasure to introduce our friend Carol tonight. As executive director, Carol David oversees the operations of the Missouri Prairie Foundation, a 57-year-old land trust, including Grow Native, MPF's 23-year-old native plant marketing and education program. Carol has worked for 25 years in conservation and environmental communications, development, administration, and leadership for private and nonprofit conservation groups and also municipal and state governments. Editor of the wonderful Missouri Prairie Journal since 1997, Carol writes articles on native gardening, has edited field guides, and enjoys speaking to groups about native gardening, prairie conservation, and related topics. So Carol, please take it away. Thank you very much. Can you hear me all right? We sure can. Well, thank you, Dana and Ethan, for inviting me. I'm very pleased to speak. Um, and I'll take questions at the end, but if there is um, a question, uh, you know, I can maybe, you know, uh, Ethan or Dana will, will interrupt me as they see fit to uh, answer a question maybe in between. And I also just want to say <clears throat> how much I admire the Missouri R River Bird Observatory and the work that Dana and Ethan do. They're wonderful colleagues. Uh, we work together on, um, on a number of different conservation initiatives, and they um, uh, do bird surveys on a number of our prairies, in which we are very uh, grateful that they do that. Um, so I'm going to talk about why prairie matters and why as now as even unfortunately as we're losing so much of it, we realize how even more relevant it is, uh, more relevant than ever. But first, a bit of introduction about the Prairie Foundation. Dana already did share some of this with you. And uh, we also administer the Missouri Invasive Plant Council through our Grow Native program. And we have a lot of resources at all three of those websites that you see on the screen. I've spent uh, quite a bit of time over the course of my career with the Prairie Foundation explaining what prairie is and what it isn't. And I have a friend from uh, New York City who lived in Missouri for a while, and I told her what I did for a living, and I explained about prairie and how rare it was. And she said, what are you talking about? This state is covered in grass. How could this be rare? And the state is covered in a lot of grass. Um, I, the photos here kind of tell a story about how prairie can be a bit um, maybe difficult to understand if it, to if you don't know anything about prairie, like my friend from New York City. Um, the photo on the left is not prairie. It's grass, but it's not prairie. It's tall fescue, which is originally a Eurasian grass, and it was introduced in the United States and, and cultivated and really released um, for widespread planting in the 1950s and through the 70s. Um, today, there was an estimated 14 million acres of tall fescue grass in Missouri. That's almost a third of our state covered in one species, but it's not prairie. The photo on the right is an original unplowed prairie that the Missouri Prairie Foundation owns. In fact, it's one of the most botanically rich prairies on the whole planet. It won a it's it not a, it it broke a world a, a, a world record for plant species diversity on a fine scale. But if you were to drive by this prairie in the winter time, it looks just like grass. It looks pretty monotonous. But imagine that photo on the right. Imagine if all that gold were blue, a blue ocean. It's kind of the same thing. You look at it at an ocean and it just looks monotonous and it's all the same. But you know that if you were to go scuba diving or snorkeling in that ocean, you would see tremendous diversity. And a prairie is, is, like, is like that, only it's terrestrial. Now, an ecologist will tell you that uh, prairie is a native grassland ecosystem, uh, complex in, in the uh, amount of uh, different species um, and the ecological interactions that happen on a prairie. It's dominated by perennial warm season grasses, wildflowers, legumes, sedges, some shrubs, and generally less than 10% tree cover. And what we mean by warm season is plants that are maturing in the warmest part of the year. So you may be familiar with Timothy grass or brome grass. Those are generally um, flowering and then setting seed in, in May or June. They're done. Those are cool season grasses. They're, they're not from North America. Um, 
they evolved in a cooler cl uh, climate. Uh, other, other, not, not here. So you'll see those things have already seeded, you know. Um, but then the prairie grasses and many prairie wildflowers, uh, especially the grasses, aren't many of them aren't flowering until July or August. There can be as many as 800 different kinds of plants. If you look at the totality of all prairie remnants that are left in Missouri and, and, and did a survey of all the plants, as many as 800. And these plants provide this foundation um, for a really rich food chain and, and uh, provide habitat and food for thousands of arthropods and other invertebrates, and then higher level organisms, amphibians, reptiles, mammals, birds, and some of these animals are completely dependent on prairie habitat to survive. Some are grassland species, um, but not necessarily dependent exclusively on prairie. So prairie is a kind of grassland, but there are other kinds of grassland than prairie. Another hallmark of prairie are the complex deep root systems. Now this illustration, some of you may have seen before, it's hypothetical. Um, you know, north of the Missouri River in the glaciated plains, the soil is very deep and, and many of these plants can, can attain these depths. But in southwest Missouri, where the ground's really rocky, they may not grow quite that deep because they've got a lot of rocks to navigate in the soil. Um, but these root systems over thousands of years of growing and decaying, they've created some of the richest soil in the world. And they store large amounts of atmospheric carbon and they slow and filter stormwater. And we'll talk more about that in a, in a bit. Now, all of that root mass is supporting another kind of community, a microbial community in the soil. And this is largely due to continuous inputs of organic substances from the roots into the soil. It's kind of like the roots are farming this, this this diversified farm of microbes. And there was research done in 2012 that showed that the more diverse kinds of vegetation you have of different kinds of species of plants, um, you'll have a correlation of a diversity of mycorrhizal fungi in the soil. Um, and mycorrhizal fungi are fungi that live in association with roots. Um, we are really fortunate in Missouri that we know how much prairie we had um, before European American settlement, and that's thanks to the work of Dr. Walter Schrader, who's an emeritus professor of geography at University of Missouri, and he spent 12 years uh, of 12 summers in between teaching. He spent the summers in the basement of the state capitol in Jefferson City looking at old notes of um, from the General Land Survey office reading descriptions of the land that surveyors wrote and from their notes he could ascertain where prairie was and where it wasn't. So all of the orange that you see on the map is uh, prairie. It's like a blueprint of the prairie that we had, you know, that we had before European American settlement. And this was published in 1981. A student of Dr. Schrader's named Dr. James Harlan, he went a step further and he matched all pre-settlement vegetation, not just prairie. And you can find this map and at the county level from the Missouri Herpetological Atlas Project. And you may it may be available elsewhere, but that's where I um, tend to, to look for it. So you'll see with the um, legend here of the different colors, the um, yellowish color is prairie, what, similar to what you saw with the Schrader map. Um, the kind of um, the kind of the light blue and the light green are woodland. And especially that open woodland would have had an understory of prairie plants. So you can see pre-settlement Missouri had actually very little true forest. And Missouri was very much, these habitats, prairie and woodland, very much dependent on fire to sustain them and all of their uh, diversity. And if you take into account all of this open woodland and prairie and then savannas, what's called barrens and scrub, probably savanna and glades, we're looking at probably, you know, something like 70% of our state had some assemblage of prairie species. So we're very much a grassland state um, uh, in, our, in our natural history of our state. There's not just one kind of prairie. Uh, I'm gonna just show you a few slides of some different prairie types. Um, ecologists have actually determined there are 23 distinct prairie types 
in Missouri, dependent on location on the landscape, if it's an upland or a bottomland prairie, it's dependent on kind of uh, rock underlying, if it's sandstone or, or chert or dolomite or limestone, and there are other factors as well. Um, this is a very dramatic landform called Lost Hill Prairies. They're in extreme northwestern Missouri, and they have very dry adapted plants on them. There are sand prairies near Missouri's boot heel and historically along the Mississippi River in northeast Missouri um, as well. But today they're extremely rare, as are those Lost Hill prairies. In the Osage Plains, which then as you go into Kansas, you get into the Flint Hills, um, flatter terrain. You might be familiar with these kinds of landscapes. In northern Missouri, the glaciated plains. Um, really rich soil, incredible prairies, but there's very little prairie left in the glaciated plains because it was glaciated. So it was easier to plow, it wasn't rocky, and just incredibly rich soil for agriculture. This is a small remnant owned by the conservation department. It's called Helton Prairie Natural Area. It is just unbelievably beautiful and diverse. So aesthetically, um, what I think uh, is so sort of aesthetically captivating about prairie that I think other people feel as well, is you have two visual things going on. You have this wide open space, but then you also, if you look down, you have this incredible detail, um, detail of different kinds of plants and you have bird song and you have insect song. So it's a really, um, sort of aesthetically stimulating dichotomy to have this wide open landscape, but then all this um, detail of sound and color and, and, th and different kinds of uh, species. And um, I, I really love this photo because you, you wouldn't have seen, well, for a lot of reasons, it's very cute, but also you wouldn't have seen this unless you really got down into a prairie because these are downy gentians that you really can't see unless you get down into prairie because they're they're growing pretty close, you know, maybe maybe a foot off the ground, you know, in the fall when the grasses are really tall. So you need to have a close encounter with prairie or I encourage you to have a close encounter with prairie so you can really um, experience it in, with all the senses. Um, you may have seen this map before. So the prairie region in the United States, and of course these regions extend into Canada, but I have a map that includes Canada. So in Missouri, we are in the tall grass prairie region. And as you go west across the continent, you have mixed grass, short grass, the vegetation height correlates with less rainfall as you go west. So we have more rainfall here in Missouri than we do in Colorado. We have less, though, in Georgia. Um, and prairie, as we think about it today, developed about 8,000 years ago, but it's really millions of years in the making. And if you want to know more about that, I can send a link or maybe put it in the chat later of a really good article that um, Doug Ladd wrote about prairie history. And depending on the region, prairie evolved with fire, drought, and grazing animals. Sometimes all three, sometimes one more than the other. It just depends, like as you go out west, climate is more of a factor than fire. But as you go east, um, fire is more of a, of a component. And then grazing, you know, it wasn't like there were herds of bison and elk uniformly through the entire prairie region. So in some areas, I think grazing pressure um, shaped prairie more than in other areas. Another map that um, you may not have seen, or, or maybe you have, uh, helps expand our idea of grassland regions, at least in Eastern North America. And there are prairie types or grassland types throughout the world and throughout North America. There are marshy grasslands on Long Island in New York. There are prairies in Washington state. Um, in the Southeast part of the United States, we have what's called the Southeast Interior Grasslands, which includes the southern third of Missouri with all of our glades and a number of our Ozark prairies, the coastal pine savannas, um, really a rich array of uh, river scours that are grass fens. Um, just in, in like Alabama, there are these incredibly diverse glades and um, prairies in Mississippi and Louisiana and Arkansas. So it's really, um, it's wonderful to learn more 
and really expand our understanding um, of different grassland types. And in Missouri, the the you know it's it's pretty interesting because we have savanna and prairie that has a lot of things in common, even you know in states north of Missouri, and then in the southern third, um, a lot of our grasslands, native grasslands, have things in common with uh, other southeastern grassland types. Um, you know, when Euro Americans came to the Midwest. They, you know, wasn't this untouched landscape. There were people living here for a very, very long time and shaping prairie. And we have evidence that Native Americans were using Missouri's tall grass prairies in the form of these shoes. Um, this photograph is an 8,000 year old shoe made out of a plant called Rattlesnake Master. You see the illustration of the plant in the slide as well. So we know that Rattlesnake Master is a prairie plant, and we know that people used this plant to make these shoes. Therefore, they were living on and with prairie. Um, and so, uh, about eight between eight and four thousand years ago, the climate got into this warmer and drier period, which helped spread prairie. Then at about 4,000 years, we entered into a wetter phase, which then favored woodland over prairie. But at the, at the same time, Native American fire practices were really overriding climate as a factor, and that use of fire really perpetuated prairie. And um, Native Americans were living have, in the tall grass prairie region 10 to 22,000 uh, years ago, 2,200 years ago, and they first were using burning in woodlands to encourage growth of food plants and then that spread in, to grasslands. And we don't know the full extent of fire tending by the Osage and their ancestors, but we do know that they used it for driving game and encouraging new vegetation, but in a very carefully planned and organized manner. It wasn't, at all, it wasn't haphazard, it was very planned. And we really have Native Americans to thank for perpetuating this native grassland system, which in addition to its immense natural wealth, really formed the backbone of our economy in the Midwest. When you think about all the agri you know, row crop agriculture and, and cattle pastures in this original prairie landscape, and then all of the agricultural industry that you know it, um, provides for so many jobs in, in in the Midwest. I mean, it's all has its roots with prairie, and with the role of Native Americans in shaping prairie. At the time of the forest removal of Osage Nation members from Missouri in 1825, more than a third of the state was tall grass prairie, and another third was savanna and open woodland. Um, because of the role of Native Americans, uh, the particular the Osage and their ancestors, uh, the Prairie Foundation has uh, developed this acknowledgement statement to respectfully acknowledge that the land that we work to protect was the homeland of a diversity of Native American nations prior to European American settlement. The land in our care continues to have cultural significance for the Osage, Missouri, Sac and Fox, Iowa, Kaw, and other Native American nations. We're mindful that these nations had a significant role in shaping the landscape and that they continue a sacred relationship with the lands we protect. We recognize and appreciate their contributions to the cultural heritage of this region and to the history of North America. We honor them as we protect the ecological integrity of the lands in our care. We are replicating the use of fire by the Osage and their ancestors through prescribed burning. We burn a third to a half of the prairies that we own and manage annually. We do this between October and uh, mid-March. Try to finish up as, uh, as close to the end of February as we can, but we, we do go into mid-March. Um, we are very fortunate to have uh, wonderful volunteers that help. We also do some um, hire contractors to do some burns as well. But right now, Jared Hubner, our director of prairie management, I think he did three burns last week. He's, he was out doing um, fire, preparing fire lines today. 
So he makes use of every good weather day in the dormant season for burning. Um, so we had these 15 million acres of prairie and we have very little left today and I'll, I'll show a map in a moment. Um, prairie was converted to other uses. We converted prairie for row crops from 1837 to the present day. Um, and there are prairies getting plowed under. There were, I think, a couple last year. Um, it, 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 it continues to happen. Also, we've lost prairie through fire suppression. As I mentioned, um, the Osage and their ancestors were, were regularly burning, but when you had Euro-Americans settling on the land, fire was something um, that needed to be, you know, controlled and uh, or that they that they controlled and, and it wasn't used in the same manner. And, and because of that, we have tree growth. So if you think about, you know, in the middle part of in Missouri, we have the eastern deciduous forest and the Great Plains kind of meeting here. And it's this interplay between those two major biomes. And it's not the trees are bad. It's just if if we lose prairie, we lose a lot of biodiversity. We we become um, a less biologically diverse state. And of course, all the places where we work and live and go to school, and we've converted so much of the landscape of all habitat types to uh, places where we, you know, turning that we've turned them into humanscapes. So we had 15 million acres of prairie up until statehood in, in 1821, and today we have fewer than 50,000 scattered unplowed prairie acres left in the Missouri National Heritage Database as of 2022 and as of 2023 too. So this is a really sobering loss, but you know all those photos I showed you of those prairie landscapes um, are these are in these little dots. So there's still a lot we we have to. It's our belief that we must protect as many of these uh, remaining remnant prairies as we possibly can. And so that's what the Prairie Foundation does. We um, own and manage prairie. We buy prairie or sometimes prairies are donated to us um, whenever we can. We now own 31 properties, uh, 30 shown on the map, but we purchased another one at the end of December. We also uh, do prairie plantings, are also called reconstructions. We're creating a 40-acre prairie planting within Creefcore Park in um, St. Louis. And over the years, we've done other planting or helped fund other plantings. Um, today, we have, so these acres that we own, uh, total 4,349 acres, and they're open to all to enjoy on foot. On our website, we have maps and more information about each of these properties. And we just, we want to save more. We're on a mission to save as much as we can. And if you'd like to be involved, we would be thrilled. So why is it important? Well, as I mentioned before, in terms of our culture, um, prairie is part of our shared natural inheritance. It's shaped our economy and, and so much of our culture. It's important because even though those, those dots on the map or those specks on the map um, look so tiny and you wonder if they're still important. They are still vitally important habitat for prairie and native grassland dependent plants and animals, including pollinating insects. I mean, there are there are um, many species like uh, grassland frogs and many plant species like, um, like uh, grass pink orchids and regal fritillary butterflies who can't not live anywhere else but on original prairie. These prairie remnants are also important because they're seed sources for the native seed industry. If we don't have original prairie, we can't create prairie plantings. We can't create more bird habitat, grassland bird habitat, if we don't have those seeds from those original remnants. And those um, prairie plantings are important not just for wildlife habitat, but also for stormwater management, carbon storage, pollinator protection, and they provide other benefits to people as well in, in rural, suburban, and urban areas. And I do want to spend just a few slides talking about pollination and pollinating insects because prairie is so vitally important habitat for um, more species of pollinating insects in Missouri than any other kind of habitat, prairies and other, grass, other native grasslands. More than 400 different kinds of pollinating insects, in fact. 
And pollination, of course, is the successful transfer of pollen from the flower of one plant to the flower of another of the same species. And, and pollination occurs primarily either by wind. About 15% of flowering plants in the world are wind pollinated, like oaks, hickories, corn, bamboo, and other grasses. This is why many of us who have hay fever have terrible allergies when, when the oak flowers are blooming, because those oak flowers are, are using the wind. But 85% of flowering plants require an animal, mostly insects, and most importantly, bees, to move pollen. And in Missouri, um, the primary pollinators are um, clockwise from the top left, butterflies, bees, native flies, beetles, wasps, and moths. And of these, bees actively collect and transport pollen and provide for their young. And they uh, have a kind of behavior called flower constancy. So they, um, uh, on, a for, on, a, on a pollen foraging trip, they tend to visit the same kind of flower and only that flower. So they might go out and go to a blazing star, blazing star, blazing star. And another foraging trip, they might go to coneflower, coneflower, coneflower. If they were to mix up these flowers, they would be transporting pollen from one species to another species and, it, and you wouldn't have pollination. So it's thanks to this behavior that bees exhibit that we have we have fruits and veg so many fruits and vegetables to enjoy. And pollinators are critically important to healthy ecosystems for you know recruitment of, of new plants, you know, for seed set and fruit set so that we have new plants. Uh, fruits and seeds are, of course, a major part of the diet of um, many birds and mammals and other, other animals. And also the pollinators themselves become food for wildlife. And they're incredibly important for our own health. 35% of crop production worldwide, um, uh, pollinating insects are responsible for, for that uh, percentage. Um, high value of crops in the U.S. Um, that are pollinated or their pollination is improved upon by insects. And if you think about our most nutritious foods, they are fruits and vegetables and by and large insect pollinated plants. This is a whole foods market during National Pollinator Week, the produce section with bee pollinated crops. And then they took all of the bee pollinated crops away. If they had taken the fly pollinated crops and other crops away, you would have even greater paucity of fruits and vegetables to enjoy. And this is just the fresh produce section. It doesn't include the pasta sauce or the blackberry jam or the coffee or the chocolate um, and other insect pollinated uh, crops. That, that may seem like a slight digression, but I, I think it's so important because these grassland habitats are so incredibly important for pollinating insect habitat. So there are very there are many specialist pollinating um, insects that that might occur only on prairies, but there are also generalists that um, that are pollinating plants on prairies, but also on nearby um, food crops for people. Um, another hallmark of prairie is its extreme plant diversity. And in, in the very beginning of my presentation, I mentioned Pennsylvania prairie which broke a world record for plant species diversity in a 20 by 20 inch plot. That's about the size of most of the chairs that we sit in. 46 native plant species were documented. You can't even plant that many plants in that space and have them all survive. These plants have just evolved to really grow closely together and kind of, um, it's really interesting to see how the roots kind of allocate the soil. You have tap roots and then you have roots or plants with really complex roots growing together. Anyway, it's it's just incredible. Uh, and to compare in an oak hickory forest in Missouri, you might have on average seven plant species. So to have 20 or 30 or 46 native plant species in that same space is truly amazing. Um, these are two of the plants that were in that little plot, a downy gentian and June grass. And on that whole prairie, it's 160 acres. There are 289 plant species recorded, including 40 that are completely remnant dependent. But there's also abundant wildlife there, including the northern crawfish frog, Henslow sparrow, uh, northern bobwhite, and regal fritillary butterflies, which is in the bottom photo. 
Another reason why uh, we must save prairies is that while grassland birds are dependent on grasslands, not necessarily specifically on prairies per se, prairies are very important grassland habitat for grassland birds. Um, and here are, are just three of these beautiful, wonderful grassland birds, um, two of which were photographed at, at MPF prairies. So to sum up, we must protect prairie remnants um, because they are the least conserved, most threatened major terrestrial community on earth. So if you, if you believe in saving biodiversity, then this is a compelling reason. And their complexity, ecologically speaking, is irreplaceable. They're incredibly important for pollinating insect habitat, and they are still vital habitat for many plants and animals. And so again, that's what we do. We, we, we acquire land. We work with other partners uh, who own prairie as well on a, on a number of cooperative uh, uh, projects. Another compelling reason to save prairie is because they're rich with native plants and they're the sources of seed for the native plant industry. And these, so they're, they're critically important for creating prairie plantings that have many benefits to us for water quality, pollinators, and more. And these arrows are pointing to just a few of the many plant species that are sustainably harvested on prairies. Uh, so, so even if you, you know, you live in an urban or suburban area and you live far away from these prairie remnants, and they might seem a bit abstract, um, they are so important um, for uh, for people who live far away from these prairies because their seeds can be gathered and plants can be grown and, and planted in urban and suburban areas. Another uh, important aspect of um, prairie plants, uh, of using prairie plants, creating prairie plantings is for improved water quality and soil protection. And I want to highlight a, 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 an agricultural practice called prairie strips. It stands for strategic integration of row crops with prairie strips. And it was developed in Iowa. And you can see here this strip of prairie plants planted within um, a crop of uh, uh, within a cornfield. And you may uh, be familiar with the term Gulf hypoxia. That's what you see there in the yellow and blue there in the Gulf of Mexico. Hypoxia means low oxygen, and it's a, it's a it's a a phenomenon where dissolved oxygen in water is so low that it can't support living aquatic organisms. And the Gulf of Mexico is the largest um, zone hypoxic zone in the U.S. and it's second in the world, and it's caused by soil and nutrient runoff in the Mississippi watershed. Now that same watershed pre-European American settlement was largely grassland. <laughs> and all of that, you know, prairie and other native grasslands did an excellent job of holding soil in place. Um, but prairie strips, while it's not real prairie, it's prairie strips of prairie plantings can help reverse this trend. This infograph does an excellent job of summing up the benefits of prairie strips. On the left, you can see um, average loss of soil, sediment, and nutrients from a crop field. And on the right, by planting just 10% of that area in prairie strips, you see 42% less soil runoff, uh, less runoff of water, 95% less soil leaving that field, 89% less phosphorus, 84% less nitrogen. And of course, if you're planting native plants, you're going to have increased in native plant species. And then um, those plants are also supporting pollinating insects. They are supporting birds, not necessarily nesting habitat because the strips, um, if they're 30 or maybe even 60 feet, I don't think that's adequate for nesting, but it does provide um, some maybe feeding, feeding habitat perhaps for birds. So um, I hope I've made a compelling case for why saving prairie is important. And I want to just finish up here, kind of expanding a little bit to talk about not just prairie plants, but native plants in general, about how you can use them at home um, to support nature's web of life on your own property. And um, so it's really important to think 
talk about the fact that native plant species have co-evolved with pollinators and other native insect species, and they provide really important food sources for, for them. And that also to, you know, th there's a concept maybe that some people have that nature is is out there, it's being taken care of, but it isn't really out there anymore. It's not really far away anymore. We've altered 93% of land in the United States. And in order for wild species to survive, we have to make our human communities as habitable as possible for pollinators, songbirds, and other wildlife, not just to enjoy them for their aesthetic um, benefits, but when they're thriving, that means that we will have, we're thriving with clean water. Um, um, we're mitigating the amount of carbon dioxide in the air by storing carbon in the roots of plants. So with plants that are native to prairies and other habitats, we can do this. And you may be familiar with the work of the entomologist, Dr. Doug Tallamy, in his book, of bringing nature home, he and his students compiled the number of butterfly and moth larvae or species, species of butterfly and moths and, and looked at their caterpillars, what they were eating. And oak trees support the largest number. I think this is nationwide, um, not just in one part of the country. More than 500 different kinds of butterfly and moth larvae. So if you have a yard, and uh, you want to plant a tree, an oak would be an excellent choice. And they also looked at perennial plants um, and goldenrod tops the list. Of course, it's nectar and pollen are very important for adult insects, but the foliage is also important for over a hundred over hundred different kinds of, of butterfly and moth larvae. Our Grow Native program is a native plant marketing and education program. We serve not just Missouri, but the lower Midwest. And our goal is to um, increase the demand for and the supply of native plants for all of their benefits. Uh, we've got lots of resources that you may want to check out. We have um, different garden designs um, to help give you ideas on how to use native plants. Um, you can even, even if you don't have a yard, but you have a porch or a patio, you can create a native container garden. Um, here's a couple of examples of prairie gardens. Um, it's a beautiful um, plant, a native garden planted with plants in the foreground with a seeded prairie planting in the background. This is in uh, Florissant, Missouri. Um, this is at my house. I have, a, I came, our house came with a gravel pit in front of, alongside it. So I just planted glade plants and then created a strip of prairie plants on the other side. Um, this is even if you can take a small patch of, of land like this and um, create a, a garden. This is at a, a neighborhood school. And you can create prairie plantings for large landscapes. The um, photo on the right is a prairie planting, a large prairie planting that was created from what had been a fescue field. So um, that's really wonderful to think about the diversity of, of plants and animals now enjoying that vibrant landscape. Um, there, you can use prairie plantings for stormwater management. The photo on the left, just imagine if every ditch of every developed area in the country was filled with native plants and the water could allow to, to fill up that ditch. It would just be incredible. Um, and this is from Mervyn Wallace of um, Missouri Wildflowers Nursery. He has steps, I think uh, this is on his website as well, of how you can create a prairie garden at home. Um, this is, he's done this uh, like on July 3rd. So select an area, cut out um, fab, or he's using plastic. You could use um, brown paper bags too. cover it with mulch, wait a couple of months, pull the mulch away, um, and then put in your plants. Don't till this up because you're going to bring up weed seeds. You'll destroy um, soil structure, but just put the plants in and then you have a prairie garden. So but we can't have prairie gardens unless we save original prairie. And the time is now. There's just no more time to waste to save as much as we possibly can. And um, you can learn more about our work and prairies at moprairie.org. You can find lots of free resources at grownative.org. We have a number of plant sales, native plant sales um, planned for various places around Missouri um, this spring. And you can find more information on our websites. and. If 
anybody has any questions, I'm, I'm happy to take, take um, questions and I hope I can try to answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Carol. We do have um, a number of questions. Let's see here. I'm gonna go into the Q and A and Ethan, I know you are monitoring it as well. So if I miss something, please, please bring it up. Um, nope. So we have a question here from Emma. I've heard about the seeds before, but I'm curious who is collecting from Remnant Prairie? Um, and then Emma, I'm not sure I understand the second question or are they just going to expand those prairies? I'm not, I, I'm not sure what that is, but. Could you say a little more about the seed collection yeah. part, Carol? Yeah. So, um, what? So, with the Missouri Prairie Foundation, we do allow seed collectors to harvest from our prairies. We have um, a request for proposal. Uh, we put out a, a set of requirements um, under which seed can be collected, and then we invite seed collectors to submit bids to us. So we have certain stipulations about what percent can be collected at any one time, how much can be collected um, mechanically with a, a kind of a device that goes on the front of a tractor that harvests seed, how much can be collected um, by hand, um, the conditions by which the seeds can be collected, like not when the soil is not after a rain because you don't want to compact the soil. Um, the any kind of machinery has to be um, blown off with compressed air to uh, make sure there aren't any seeds of invasive plants on it. So we have really strict uh, requirements. And the Missouri Department of Conservation also um, has requests for proposals for seed harvesters as well. And I'm not sure exactly how the process, but I think it's somewhat similar to ours. I'm not sure if other um, agencies or organizations that own prairie do seed harvesting or not. Um, so, and then, so those seeds are used by those seed harvesters to grow, to either sell the seed for people to use for creating CRP plantings or prairie strips or um, pollinator habitat. Um, in some cases, in, well, in quite a few cases, we'll buy a remnant prairie, but to buy that prairie, we also have to buy some disturbed land around it, like maybe part of it was in crops, like our Snowball Hill Prairie that we bought. It's an original remnant near Kansas City, about a 20 acre, 22 acre remnant, but we had to buy like 74 acres. And so the 52 acres was all cropland. So every, every year we seeded about 10 acres at a time. So we used seed that had been collected either by ourselves or by seed harvesters at our Snowball Hill Prairie to expand prairie habitat. So I wanna make a distinction. Um, I don't like to say expand prairie because that's like saying expand tundra or expand, I mean, we can't, humans can't do that, right? We can't create an ecosystem in its entirety, but we can expand prairie habitat. So, and we do that, so we have, prairie plantings next to remnants. And that does expand habitat for things like grassland birds that need bigger areas. I hope I've answered the question properly. Thank sure. you. Really. Um, quickly, Carol, since slides are still up, um, JL, who is actually our um, liaison to the Osage Trails Master Naturalist chapter in KC, is wondering if you can go back for a sec to the slides with Dr. Talamy's data. Oh, sure. Um, because the chapter has a theme of homegrown national parks, um, which is Dr. Talamy's a project of him, I believe. Yes. So there's that one, JL. These are the woody plants and these are the perennials. We have this information available in a rack card, a, 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 you know, like a front and back card. It's called the host with the most. And you can um, you can view it on our Grow website. And we have some quantities we can give to, you know, like if you're having an event and you have a booth or whatever, and you want to share that information, we have this information in a rack card and in our Grow Native resource guide as well. Thank you. Yep. He, he got it. And then Emma, who asked the previous question said, yes, thank you for addressing that question. Sure. Um, 
Question from Jack here. Can you comment on the status of the St. Louis restoration? Yes. So the, the 40 acres are within Creedcourt Park along Marine Boulevard. So across from the lake and near, oh, I forget the name of the other road. Um, it's in a, you know, it's a, well, the whole thing is a bottomland area, right? You know, because it's near the river. There was a, so when we, we hired contractors, we, we did out the work, we hired contractors and um, they're doing a great job, but it, it is a fairly difficult site because there was a lot of Johnson grass there, which is a non-native invasive plant. And like prairie grasses, it's also a warm season grass. It's from originally from somewhere in the African continent, I believe. So that makes it tricky because <laughs> um, there are different herbicides that work on diff on like cool season grasses or warm season grasses. So Johnson grass is always tricky because you don't want to harm other warm season native plants when you're trying to control Johnson grass. So they, um, when you're doing a planting, you really want to really control those invasives because if you don't, once you seed and then you have invasives with the natives, it's just really hard to control those. Um, so they had to work for really like a year and a half controlling invasives plants. And then last July, St. Louis had that freak like eight inch rain in one day and it flooded a whole bunch of that area. So I'm concerned that that brought in other weed seeds. But anyway, um, but anyway, they 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 really you know got the prepped the site well and seeded it a few weeks ago. So it's super exciting. Um, it does take about three years to have something that you want to introduce to mom and dad. If that makes sense, like you know, um, it's going to you know you can't expect a planting to to look like, you know, an 8,000 year old original prairie remnant, you know, overnight. Um, there'll be a lot of annual weeds, but you, you mow high, you mow um, prairie plantings high, and then after three years burning, and that will help. And then we'll, we'll always have to be vigilant about treating, you know, invasives. There will be paths mowed um, through, and then it, the, the planting is also right next to, um, one of the Great Rivers Greenway greenways. So people will be able to enjoy it by bike, driving by and on Marine Avenue, and then also on foot if they want to walk through those mode paths. Um, we also uh, did a couple um, rain garden plantings with the same grant at, for the city of Bridgeton and did a, a really a small um, prairie planting there and the 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 bio swales are looking really good and the little planting there um, the prairie planting is coming along that's at the um, city of Bridgeton Recreation Center. Carol this is actually a little bit out of order as far as our question list but relevant so Susan asks from St. Louis which prairie do you suggest we visit? Um well, if you if you're you know if you don't mind driving several hours, <laughs> um, the Prairie Foundation's Linden's Prairie, it's right off. It's like just a couple miles off of Highway 44, um, not too far from Mount Vernon, Missouri. It is spectacular prairie. It is it's just so beautiful. You might cry. <laughs> I mean, it's so beautiful. Um, unfortunately. Um, there are closer to St. Louis, there are some prairie remnants within Quiver River State Park, which is um, near Troy, Missouri, about an hour north of St. Louis. There are original hilltop prairies south of Belleville, Illinois. One is called Foltz Hill. It's an Illinois nature preserve. It's really cool. We had a Prairie Foundation field trip there last September. Um, there are not prairies, but there are a couple of really beautiful glades in Jefferson County, not too far from St. Louis. And those are another type of grassland. Um, for prairie plantings, a wonderful place is the prairie planting at Shaw Nature Reserve, which is just about 20 minutes from the I-44 270 interchange in Gray Summit, Missouri. So it's not an original prairie, but it's 
it really helps, you know, you get an idea of what prairie was like. And they have beautiful native gardens as well, more gardeny gardens um, in the Whitmire Wildflower Garden at Shaw Nature Reserve. Thank you, Carol. Since you just mentioned Illinois, I just want to read a comment here from Retta. We, they say we live in the trees, many oaks. I had to study a lot and plant a lot of natives. So, so much has come up. We are a registered pollinator patch. It is somewhat popular here in Springfield, Illinois. Fantastic. That was a nice, nice comment. Very nice. <clears throat> Congratulations um, for you for doing that. And it's nice to hear that it's popular in that area as well. Um, is there information available for when the best time is to visit each Mo Prairie for spring, summer, or fall viewing, asks Kathleen. We don't have that kind of detailed information. Um, it also depends like in terms of really, you know, seeing like beautiful displays of wildflowers. So as I mentioned, we, we, we burn about a third to a half of each of our prairie tracks every year. So the areas that have been burned are generally going to be showier, you know, because you just won't have all of the past year's standing spent vegetation. But that we but we rotate every year, so it's for the health. So we you know we're not burning the same little patch or same patch each time. So that would be a lot to keep track of which area we burn. Um, but I will tell you that the um, prairies in south of Sedalia in late April are tend to be quite showy with things like um, paintbrush and violets. So like late April is a really good time. Early June is when you usually see the cone flowers, the, the pale purple cone flowers. And then July, August, uh, blazing stars. And then like September, so many things like Maximilian sunflowers, you know, a lot of yellow. Um, National Prairie Day is the first Saturday of June. And we have a prairie bio blitz that we've planned for our Carver Prairie. We haven't announced it yet, except I just did now. Um, and it's near Joplin. Jop Carver Prairie is near Joplin. And um, it's a day where you can um, go out with naturalists and learn about specific groups of organisms and soils and ecology. And we usually have a potluck dinner and um, you can camp on the prairie. It's one of the few times that we allow camping. And so you get to experience a prairie like, you know, in 24 hours, which is really, um, really lovely. That's a nice announcement. The bio blitzes are super fun. And Dana and Ethan have been a part of many of them and it's always, they're always very popular. It's so, it's so nice to learn from all of the experts that you assemble um, for the, you know, various various groups it, yeah it, it's it's nice because it's it's all and it just people are so excited to learn you know it's just like it's your people you know <laughs> it's your prairie people <laughs> absolutely carol jack has a question about um highway prairie strips we have all seen prairie restorations along interstate highways is this a is this good potential for restoring some prairie or is it more a PR opportunity? Is MoDOT interested? Well, um, MoDOT has um, done a lot of native plantings in different areas. And um, if you, for example, if you take Highway 44 from about Lebanon, Missouri to Springfield, you'll see a lot of native grasses planted there along 44. Um, it's definitely has many benefits. It reduces the amount of mowing that has to be done. It does provide native habitat for a number of species there along, you know, long roadways. And in cases where there is original habitat, you know, whether woodland or prairie, having those native plants that, that might adjoin a roadway, you know, having native plants there, it does help, you know, buffer that remnant habitat and provide, you know, habitat in the form of the strip. So, um, but I think 
you know, Modern has a lot um, on their plate. You know, they they have to, you know, take care of all of the roadways themselves, make sure they're safe, um, and then all of the roadside management as well. But if you like seeing native plantings along um, roadways that MoDOT oversees, do let them know. They are very responsive. There's a comment, um, a number to call on the MoDOT website to comment. And you can say, you know, gosh, I just really love seeing native plantings, love what you're doing, would love to see more of that. And also um, when you see um, invasive plants being treated, likewise, do you compliment them, tell them how much you appreciate that? Because there are some people who may not like to see taller plants and they might hear a lot from those people. So, um, but it's your right to um, comment as well. So, like I said, they're very responsive. Um, you can also adopt a section of highway. MoDOT has an adopt a highway program. It's not just for a little cleanup, but you can actually adapt a section and plant um, native uh, plants. Um, the Prairie Foundation, we adapted a section of highway along 49 south of Kansas City. And we do, we do call volunteers pick up litter, but also we've seeded um, native plants along there as well. I hope I've answered your question. Carol, we have two questions that are kind of similar from Sean and Steve. So I'm just going to kind of ask them at the same time. Besides the Prairie Foundation, is MDC or the Nature Conservancy trying to buy some of the existing remnant re remaining high quality prairies? And relatedly, how many more native prairie acres are out there in Missouri still in private hands, i.e. possible future acquisition targets for MPF? Good questions. So there are about 50,000 acres of scattered original prairie acres recorded in the Missouri National Heritage Database. And this is a database that is administered in Missouri by the Missouri Department of Conservation. So species of conservation concern, national communities of conservation concern are all recorded both on public and private land um, where with permission of private landowners. So of those 50,000 acres of remaining prairie, about 25, maybe 26,000 are in conservation ownership. So owned by the Conservation Department, Department of Natural Resources, the Nature Conservancy, the Missouri Prairie Foundation, um, the University of Missouri owns a uh, Tucker Prairie along Highway I-70, the Ozark Land Trust owns Woods Prairie. I might be missing some, but I think those are all of the prairie owners. Mm. So we're looking at a roughly 25,000 acres that are in, um, in, that are owned by individual private landowners. This year, um, we have a, a grant from the Missouri Department of Conservation to launch a private remnant prairie landowner support group to help um, those who own original remnant prairies, help them know about different cost share programs that might be available to them to help them, you know, afford to take care of these prairies, um, help them, you know, if, if they're interested with plant ID, both native and invasive, learn how to uh, control invasive plants if they need help, um, introduce those private those private landowners to each other and they might be able to help each other with prescribed burns, for example, um, help them understand about conservation easements that they might want to um, place their land in, um, or they might even want to or just to, to learn about the Prairie Foundation if they don't already know about us. In terms of other groups actively purchasing prairie, um, I can't speak for all of them, but I know the Conservation Department um, a few years ago purchased um, Barrier Prairie Conservation Area south of Kansas City, and the Prairie Foundation donated a small amount of money, and um, Burroughs Society of Greater Kansas City donated a very nice donation to help pay for that um, property that the Conservation Department owns. I know that the Nature Conservancy has added land to its Dunn Ranch area. I don't think what they've added is the original prairie, but they're definitely, you know, want to make it native grass on habitat. Um, you know, different conservation groups have different uh, models for conservation and different goals. Um, 
we we are really focused on those like hyper biologically diverse areas, even if they're small and even if they're isolated. Um, we do, of course, if, if, a, if an original prairie is next to another prairie, that makes it, you know, really high priority to protect. Um, but even if it's, um, you know, isolated, we still think it's important to protect that because of its irreplaceable biodiversity. Carol, we have a question that got answered. So Jillian asked, um, and I just wanted to point it out because they said, can you recommend where to buy native plants or native seed? Leary of online seed companies would prefer to buy local. Um, and then a later note says, disregard, found the answer on grownative.org. Great. Perfect. <laughs> um, couple more questions in the Q&A if you're... If you remain available to us, Carol, is that okay? Yeah, I can keep talking. <laughs> um, so Mary is interested in learning more um, about the prairie strips. Uh, are you working independently with farmers to create these prairie strips? Or are you collaborating with MDC to work with farmers to create them on farmland? I would like more information on approaching farmers with this information. Sure. And um, I... I, I'm not sure I can type, you know, for some reason, I, my mouse won't let me type in the chat, but if you go to grown, um, go to moprairie.org and then you click on prairie management from the drop down menu, you'll see another thing called prairie strips. And if you click on there, there's a, a video, there's a fact sheet. So there's some more information there and there's some other links. And through next year, I have a grant from the from Iowa State University to pay for half of the seed that a, a, a farmer may purchase for this practice, and the USDA will pay the other half. So it's 100% paid for. Um, and um, I'm not working with MDC other than uh, I definitely let private land conservationists know that I had this grant. And so when they're working with farmers, they're, you know, just keeping it in mind to let them know that I have this grant. Um, I uh, was able to speak to um, staff with the Natural Resource Conservation Service about the Prairie Strips grant. So that's been really great. Um, there have been, let's see, I wanna say, is it five or seven farmers um, that have maybe even more than that that have contacted me and you know or want to take advantage of that grant money that I have and are installing prairie strips so it's encouraging very nice carol ethan and i jinxed each other we both put that link in the chat at the same time so if folks want to check out that link that carol just described it's there um let's see so Emma asked, and I must admit, I've had the same question myself. Is there a worry of strips along busy highways being ecological traps, such as insects and birds being hit by cars? There have been studies about that, and I can't tell you definitively, but it's my understanding that it it there's a um that vehicle speed plays a role. That at high speeds, like 70 and greater, that not universally, but it tends to kind of create this wind where the insects, they kind of go up over the car and at slower speeds, kind of the same thing, but it's sort of those mid speeds, like maybe 40 to 60, where you do get some. Um, yes, there is mortality, but I think the net, there's a, still a net gain. Um, but the other thing is, I mean, the more habitat you have on one side of the road and that if it can continue, you know, just continue away from the road, you know, so that that's going to, I would think, you know, keep those insects, you know, the, the, if they have a lot of food sources right there, then hopefully they won't have to, you know, travel as much. But but yeah, just having those isolated strips, it it does cause it, but um, I think the net result is there's still a gain because you've increased habitat. Just relatedly to the highway question, Betsy just asked, how are burns handled on the highway strips or are no burns done? 
Um, I am not sure that there are any burns in Missouri along roadways. There, if and, and there are places like you might have a prairie planting in a city where you know it may not be possible to burn. Say, for example, if there are power lines right overhead or things like that. Um, and and you do have to be careful. You have to check with wind speed. And like we do too, like some of the prairies that we own are right next to lettered highways. And so we have to burn those on, you know, certain day when the wind's blowing a certain direction so it won't blow onto the road, the smoke, I mean. Um, but if you can't burn, I mean, there are ways to manage a, a prairie planting. Um, it, it can, you know, be, it can be, it can be mowed. I mean, and if you, you've got to do something or you will have woody species coming in. Um, so, you know, all mowing is not bad. And, and you know, if it, 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 we'd have to mow road white plantings at some point or you're going to have woody growth. I mean, it's, it's just a matter of, um, you know, maybe finding that optimal time to, to mow. So, for example, if there are invasive plants that have gone to seed that you're not mowing <laughs> and spreading those seeds. Um, and don't want to mow during bird nesting period in case there are birds nesting in, you know, along that roadway. Um, so it's all about, so you, yes, you can mow if you can't burn. It's just about finding the best time to mow. Carol, we have one more question. We, oh, Eve, go did, ahead. Did. Yeah, we also have one that was up in the chat. Uh, JL Johnson, she asked up up there too it was a while ago. Oh, at, okay. Like Six forty two. But yeah, she was wondering, and I often, I, I this is kind of my interest area too. Um, she didn't want to interrupt, but she said there was a slides that she didn't get screenshots of. Yeah, we so we did for, that. We did. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Yep. We sure did. The, the the ranks. Yep. Okay. The good. the number of. Oh. Also, I, yep. Yeah. Um, also, I would like to um, just let everybody know that this is recorded. It will be on YouTube if you want to share it later as well. So sure. we'll send that with the follow up. Um, one more question about the prairie strips. Um, if farmers are planting prairie strips alongside their crops, are they not affected by whatever chemicals are being used on the crops? I love the idea of it, but I wonder if there could be conflicts. Um. That is a challenge, but I've also seen corn fields right up next to a mowed lawn and the mowed lawn is okay. So I think, I mean, and I'm not a farmer, so, and I don't know about farm machinery, but from colleagues that I that I work with who are more familiar with this, there is um, a lot, there's just been incredible advancements in precision agriculture, machinery that can be very precise on how fertilizer or, um herbicide is applied um so it, it is a challenge but there's i mean it's still i think it's still better to have native plants there than to not have them there right um so so you know in other words even if you know, even if you had a, a bit of damage to the native plants, well, that spray might still be going there and there's no plant to sort of catch it. You know, it's it's still helping, I would think, to interface or absorb absorb it. Um, but like I say, I, I and, and I think the farmers, you know, they're, they're not using more than they have to because it's expensive, you know, so they want to be as precise as they can um, with those those chemicals because they're expensive. Eve, unless I'm not seeing something and you're seeing something, um, I think we have finished with our questions. I think we have too. Right. Yep. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of compliments in it throughout the chat thread that we'll we'll be able to share with you, Carol, too, to make sure you're able to see all the comments people have made in the chat. Yep. I. I'd like to share just one that said, "You and MPF are rock stars. You are a gift to us." Oh, got it. Well, what, <laughs> I just had what, to read that one out because I agree. Oh, that's so sweet. Well, thank you, Dan and Ethan, for the opportunity. Thanks for everybody um, for.
for the opportunity to speak and I enjoyed it and um, um, thanks for your interest in conservation and, and hope to see you out on a prairie soon.